Good evening. You're watching the smoking section with Steve Helfer, and uh, today I am going to be without a guest, so I'm going to wing it on my own, my very own, and uh, I hope perhaps I will get a phone call uh, but from one of our viewers, perhaps uh, have a little conversation going, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I was very happy to see uh, today on Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights Facebook page that it appears uh, that President Obama has uh, again started smoking, if he ever stopped. And uh, I think this, you know, he looks very relaxed in the photo and he's uh, grabbing for a cigarette is what it appears. And I think this is important because uh, it shows that uh, he may be reclaiming his uh, autonomy and not uh, kowtowing uh, to the anti-smoking Nazis uh, who have made smoking symbolic of uh, someone who does not do what he's supposed to do. So I think uh, he is asserting perhaps his individualism and, and of course I think it would make him a better president, uh, reducing his uh, anxiety improving his concentration, uh, making him more tolerant. And uh, I, I think it would be actually very good if more and more people in the government did smoke. I think they would be able to broker those deals that used to be made uh, when lawmakers could sit around and smoke cigarettes and smoke cigars and smoke pipes. Uh, and like Native Americans, uh, instead of disagreeing and not compromising uh, the influence of tobacco, which of course goes way back in our country in the Americas and uh, was used in councils. Uh, Indians would never ever go into a council with another tribe or even amongst themselves without the tobacco, which they believed made them think better and understand their enemies are those people with whom they disagreed with better. Uh, so I think that if President Obama resumes smoking, it would really be nice if he did it in a very open way. Uh, and perhaps now that he is a second term president and does not have to worry about reelection, it would be very interesting uh, if he reversed the ban that Hillary Clinton put in the White House, uh, where she was the first, uh, she was the first uh, to decide that the White House would be no smoking. Of course, any president, I assume, has the <clears throat> the power to reverse that. Uh, I think it would be nice, uh, but I'm not hoping. Uh, I, I'm not uh, going to bet on it because uh, I don't think uh, I, I. I just can't imagine the kind of. Um, storm that would ensue if President Obama again started smoking openly. Uh, but again, I think this is a very good development, uh, very encouraging, uh, and I'm very glad uh, to see it on our Facebook page today, a very good photo. Uh, of course, I guess more will come out on it. I don't know when this photo appeared. I haven't seen anything about it uh, in the Boston Globe uh, yet, so uh, we'll see what's going to go on then. Uh, it was interesting that um, I got in a little discussion uh, with a reporter in the Boston Globe recently uh, because she had written uh, regarding the closing of the Harvard Primate Lab, which uh, was in West Barrow, Massachusetts, and has been around, oh, I don't know how long, I assume 60 years or so, where they have done research on primates, which I think is another word for monkeys, uh, are gorillas or chimpanzees. And they've had a lot of problems out there because uh, sometimes uh, the animals were not uh, taken care of properly. And then, of course, there are many people who are uh, ethically opposed to animal experimentation, uh, particularly when it's done on a uh, uh, in, in a way that cause, could cause uh, pain uh, to the animals, which of course is very understandable. But according to the Boston Globe, uh, the Harvard scientists 
showed, quote, unambiguously, end of quote, uh, that nicotine was addictive. And I had just been to a uh, panel discussion at Harvard recently where a neuroscientist named Joshua Buckholz had said that it was, quote, a dirty secret, end of quote, among researchers that it's very, very, very hard to get animals addicted to any drug. Uh, and I wrote The Globe and I said, I asked the reporter if she could or if she would give me a reference uh, for that particular uh, part of her article asserting that Harvard researchers showed unambiguously with animal experimentation, experimentation that nicotine was addictive. Uh, and she wrote me back that because she was leaving the globe, she didn't have all her notes handy, uh, but uh, that it was from some, uh, so, some article or study done in the 1960s, and she couldn't put her finger on it right away. Uh, I had actually CC'd the health editor of the, of the globe and so I replied to her that I didn't think that really made the grade. I mean, a reference going back to the 60s, uh, perhaps in some obscure journal. So then she emailed me back that uh, she had actually found something more recent and presumably more definitive, which I really did not look at very carefully, but it was more recent claiming that animal studies showed that nicotine was addictive. Uh, so I kind of let it drop at that, but uh, it is pretty well known among researchers, according to this neuroscientist Joshua Buchholz, that all drugs, it's difficult to get animals addicted to any drug, uh, but sp specifically nicotine. So I don't know really where that uh, reporter gets off saying that uh, it was proven that nicotine was addictive from animal studies. And then, of course, when you call nicotine a drug, uh, and people often do, uh, it brings up the question of what is the definition of drug? You know, is chamomile tea a drug? Is caffeine a drug? Uh, are, uh, is St. John's wort a drug? Um, is sugar a drug? I mean, supposedly scientists have, again, saying that they used animal models were able to get animals addicted to sugar, were able to get animals addicted to fatty foods. Basically what this means is these researchers send a press release to a, a lot of newspapers uh, trying to get some attention and maybe some more grant money. Uh, so the definition of drug is a very, very difficult uh, definition to come up with. The best definition of drug that I've seen uh, is that a drug uh, is anything that when administered to a rat produces two scientific papers. Uh, so that's about the best definition of drug I've seen, um, but I don't think nicotine is addictive uh, in the sense that uh, people take for example, millions of people take tobacco or uh, smoking cessation drugs or pharmaceuticals which contain nicotine, yet none of them get addicted to nicotine. There is no rate of addiction uh, significant or appreciable among people taking nicotine replacement therapies, which all, many of which contain nicotine. So uh, if they were in fact uh, if nicotine was addictive, you would assume that they would be getting addicted to this. And then in addition to that, uh, I looked up uh, a particularly uh, relevant quotation uh, in the 1990 Surgeon General's report, where the Surgeon General report notes uh, that almost 90 percent, uh, or that 90 percent of the almost 40 million Americans who had successfully given up smoking by that time, 90% of them had received no assistant what, assistance whatsoever in the form of counseling or nicotine cessation therapy or anything of the like. 
So if smoking itself was addictive, that certainly doesn't argue very strongly for that. I mean, if you compare that, for example, to the number of people who struggle uh, to give up opioids or struggle to give up alcohol or even struggle to lose weight, the number of Americans who very, very easily give up smoking, according to the Surgeon General, is much, much higher. So it certainly doesn't sound like really nicotine is, or even smoking, uh, is addictive in the sense that it is uh, a compulsion that is overwhelmingly difficult to give up. And that kind of brings me to uh, one of the big myths of the anti-smoking movement, or one of the uh, things that they really, really uh, are so obviously are uh, being disingenuous about, are deceptive about, and that is that, for example, when they uh, vilify tobacco companies, uh, they always like to say, depict smokers as these victims uh, who are uh, inveigled by the tobacco companies to start smoking and then become hopelessly addicted uh, and that the tobacco companies are criminals for addicting us. Uh, then at the same time, these same uh, public health officials and anti-smoking activists, when they go down to City Hall or they go down to uh, the state legislature to lobby for higher taxes on smokers, then all of a sudden, oh well, I'm making an irresponsible choice to smoke and to levy uh, a, an exorbitant tax on me is perfectly all right because it's my choice. So when they're going after the tobacco companies, they depict us as victims, and when they go after us, they depict us as some kind of criminals almost who deserve to be punished with these exorbitant taxes. And, you know, speaking of taxes, the, uh, one of the most interesting taxes that ever has been put on tobacco, of course, comes from the 1998 settlement agreement. Uh, where 46 state attorneys general sued the uh, tobacco companies, which are about four or five in number, uh, the large tobacco companies, for supposedly uh, medical costs incurred by smokers. Presumably medical costs incurred by smokers uh, that were greater than medical costs incurred by non-smokers. I don't think that was ever made terribly clear. I mean, uh, did they ever compare and see how much the non-smokers cost the state as opposed to the smokers? And at that time, Massachusetts, under Attorney General Scott Harshbarger, was part of the lawsuit, and he claimed that the medical expenses incurred by smokers were $200 million. Uh, and that this lawsuit was going to try to get some of that money back. Uh, but it's interesting that right now, Massachusetts is taking in close to a billion dollars a year in uh, cigarette taxes, and far few people smoke, fewer people smoke. So if you t subtract 200 million from 1 billion, that is an $800 million profit uh, that Massachusetts makes off of its 16% of its population who smoke. So anyway, we had these 46 state attorneys general suing the tobacco companies, and actually they ended up hiring a lot of private uh, attorneys to help them. And it was one of the biggest uh, acts of uh, government corruption uh, in a long, long time. Uh, people like Hugh Rodham, uh, who was an attorney and the brother of Hillary Clinton, were brought on board uh, not to do any work, but just to get closer to the White House. Because in this uh, tobacco settlement, or in this lawsuit, there was a great deal of machinations on the part of the government to really subvert uh, the rule of law or the due process that the tobacco companies were entitled to. So it was really a stacked deck with 46 state attorneys general, 
uh, in cahoots with the White House, uh, with a lot of trial attorneys who had uh, huge war chests made up from asbestos litigation. So the tobacco companies were really up against a wall. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to finish this uh, discussion of the Master Settlement Agreement, but I also wanted to uh, go to our Smoker of the Week uh, this week, and uh, let's see if we can get him in, into focus, as it were. Uh, this is someone who I have a feeling that um, a lot of the younger generation might not know well, uh, but he was very, very active in the 1960s, uh, and his name is Bertrand Russell. Uh, he was a mathematician who wrote a very, very uh, famous and authoritative book on mathematics, and he, during the 60s, he was very, very much against nuclear proliferation. And I believe he may have also been against the Vietnam War, although I don't, uh, I remember mostly being, uh, having to do with uh, fighting nuclear proliferation. And he founded uh, an organization called SANE, S-A-N-E. Uh, and I don't uh, remember exactly what that stands for. But he was once asked uh, if, what he liked about smoking. And his reply was uh, that he didn't really like to smoke, but he disliked not smoking. So he was one of those people, I believe, who got up uh, very early in the morning, uh, probably had his pipe uh, before, any, before even getting out of bed, and continued smoking right up until he went to sleep. And uh, even though uh, he was surrounding himself and probably to a large degree inhaling what uh, the FDA calls a toxic brew of 7,000 chemicals, uh, he lived to be uh, 98 and was very, very active uh, late in life. Uh, so not only did he live to be 98, uh, but he lived a very uh, life full 98 years, a great intellect, uh, uh, someone who was a philosopher, someone who was active in, uh, in trying to uh, change public policy. Uh, and in his autobiography, uh, he wrote something very interesting, which I will read to you, uh, and I hope you have some interest in it. And it had to do with an experience uh, that Bertrand Russell had during the Second World War. We had to go by seaplane from Oslo to Trondheim. When our plane touched down on the water, it became obvious that something was amiss. But none of us on the plane knew what it was. We later learned that all 19 passengers in the non-smoking compartment had been killed. When the plane had hit the water, a hole had been made in the plane and the water had rushed in. I had told a friend in Oslo who was finding me a place that he must find me a place where I could smoke, remarking jocularly, if I cannot smoke, I shall die. Unexpectedly, this turned out to be true. All those in the smoking compartment got out by the emergency exit window beside which I was sitting. So evidently, at least in that case, uh, if Bertrand Russell had been a non-smoker, or even if he had been in just a casual smoker and had said, well, I can sit either in the non-smoking section or the smoking section, uh, he would almost certainly have died uh, and never have had the impact uh, here and uh, in Britain uh, regarding nuclear proliferation and I'm pretty sure the war in Vietnam. Back to the uh, 1998 settlement agreement. Well, uh, the tobacco companies ended up settling, uh, and they ended up settling for approximately $200 billion, uh, which would be paid over a very lengthy period. 
Uh, and the settlement agreement was structured uh, so that, guess what, smokers would pay for it. And so everyone who smokes since 1998, who smokes conventional cigarettes at least, uh, is paying uh, on each package 50 cents. Uh, so th but the whole thing worked out basically to be a de facto tax. Uh, that did not go through a legislative body, uh, but was put through by uh, the court system. And, um, oh, let's see, I have, a, I have a phone call here. That's great, I hope. You're on the smoking section. Hi, Steve, it's Paul. Hey, Paul, how are you? Uh, pretty good, and I don't know if it's great, but I'll see what I can do. All right, I'm um, ready. I notice uh, it's it's interesting uh, hearing about these people like uh, Bertrand Russell and so on. Yes. But you know what uh, I find interesting, and it really uh, heightens the contradictions of what's going on today. Tell me. Is when I, you and you know you can check this out for yourself. They got a Facebook page called The Art of Smoking, and they have uh, web pages like uh, Smoking Celebs. Right, and the picture that you get from these is that there's a very like thriving smoking culture, you know, that appreciates the aesthetics of it. Yes, the sartorial aspect. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, looks very vibrant to me. Right, right, right well, now, and and like the authorities are completely out of step with this. Well, I hope so. I mean, I hope the authorities are out of a step with as much as they possi can possibly can be out of step with so that they take a nice fall soon. I think that's going to be their undoing. Ah, I hope so. But if, um, if you see this photograph of Obama uh, casually taking a cigarette out of a pack, uh, or what it appears to be, uh, you know, there is a, a certainly a big aesthetic to that. And... Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I think you're kind of on to something, uh, although we're under, we're, you know, this, you know, you have the aesthetic, uh, like, you, well, let, you have, let me finish and then you go. Okay. You have the aesthetic, but you also have this brute force, which mm -hmm. is so powerful. I mean, it's very powerful uh, in Hollywood and, um, you know, can't uh, this brute force, uh, you think the aesthetic force will actually uh, undo the brute force? Uh, it, well, the brute force doesn't seem to be working in Hollywood. Yeah. Because just uh, just about every actor and actress that you could possibly name smokes or is an ex-smoker. Well, right, yes, yes, uh, I suppose so. Dakota Fanning, for instance, I just learned. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm You know, mm -hmm. in our own time, she grew up. Oh, and, really? Though she's a, young, she's a young one, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and that's, uh, I think, like, the, the uh, contradiction between that and the way the authorities well, are why, acting. Well, let me ask you a question. Some, why is it that, kind of why is it that uh, none of these Hollywood celebrities speaks up uh, or speaks out against that I don't, the anti-smoking movement? I think I heard something about Connie Nielsen being active in her community. Yeah. But, yeah, I know what you're saying. They seem to be very cowed, and, uh, I mean, you don't hear Johnny Depp say anything about it. No, but on the other hand, there, there are pictures of a lot of uh, people, you know, and not just shallow celebrities. I mean, like people that have done good work and stuff like that, uh, flagrantly and unashamedly smoking. Like, I was going to ask you that picture of Obama. Yes. Does he look furtive? No, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. And is it recent? What's that? Is it recent? Yes. Uh, if you will go to our Facebook page, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights, uh, you will see it uh, very, very plainly. Uh, that is very shocking, and I wonder if he's trying to play both sides. Well, I'm hoping that maybe in his second term of president, uh, he will reassert his uh, self-autonomy and just say, heck with all of you, I'm going to enjoy a cigarette from time to time. I'm not, could, I'm not going to bet on that. I'm not going to yeah. bet on that. No, but he could and he should. He definitely could and he should. Okay, thanks yeah. for calling. That's it. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think there's room for hope, uh, as Paul is saying. And, I mean, uh, as I've mentioned often, 
1990, uh, their goal was a no smoking America by the year 2000. And here it is 2015, and the official figure for uh, people who smoke is 42 million of us. And not only 42 million of us, but more and more states are depending on our tobacco taxes. And, um, you know, I think uh, groups like Cambridge Citizens for Smoking's Rights are having some success, particularly here when we put, we were able to persuade the council not to ban smoking in all parks. Uh, now, um, I'm just going to finish up today. Uh, I hope anybody who's watching will, uh, you know, like us on Facebook or get in touch with us. We're here. Uh, we don't bite. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, instead of going home and complaining about how high your tobacco taxes are or that uh, you can't smoke in your apartment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, give us a call. Uh, we're there to help, uh, and we like to help, and it is important to be active. So remember, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights, visit us on Facebook.